For this training, we're going to be using the Windows Strict Policy. So if you'll log into your Semantic Console, and let's open up the Strict Policy for Microsoft Windows. When this policy opens, you'll notice there's three major groups in the center of the screen. Global Policy Options, Service Options, and Interactive Program Options. Under Global is where we're going to place all of our rule sets that apply to the asset as a whole. This is where we can also build things like whitelists and blacklists. We can deny access to something at the global level and then later on in the policy go and say that a particular service or an application has privileges to actually go touch that particular resource, whether that be a file, a registry setting, a network resource, or even an external device such as a thumb drive. Under service options is where we're going to find all of our server applications and our OS services. So things like RPC, Print Spooler, Microsoft IIS, Microsoft Exchange, those types of applications can be found under service options. And lastly under interactive program options. This is where we're going to find all of our end user applications. So this is where you'll find your Microsoft Office, Outlook, Outlook Express, and Internet Explorer. Let's now take a look at some of the options under Global Policy Options. So we're going to click to the left of Global Policy Options to expand some of our options. Now the first selection, Disable Prevention. This is very important to go ahead and select when working with a customer in a POC or any type of demo environment. What this is going to do is globally put the entire policy into a profile mode. So every activity, every request, every resource request is going to get um, compared to the prevention policy, but it's not actually going to get blocked on the system. However, in the event log of critical system protection, we'll see how the policy would have reacted if this if this policy had been in full prevention mode. So let's first go ahead and turn that option on by just checking the box. And the second safeguard we're going to go ahead and turn on as well is under policy override. We're going to expand on policy override and then expand on user override. And we're going to check the first box. What this is going to allow us to do is in case we get stuck or we lock ourselves out of an application during testing, this is going to allow us to, through a command line tool or GUI within Windows, disable the prevention policy. Now as you can see below allow all users to disable prevention completely, we have a few other options. Um, naturally when you move this into a production environment, you would want to select either allow specific users or groups of users to disable prevention. This will allow maybe uh, super administrators or um, power users or things of that nature to disable the prevention policy. Now keep in mind when prevention is disabled we still log all the activities so there's still going to be an audit trail of what those users did and whether it would have been blocked or whether it would have been allowed um, had the prevention policy actually been turned on. Below that you'll see user override with self protection enabled. This is the same as the full user override but this prevents those users from being able to come into the CSP agent directory and make any modifications or uninstall the application thing of that things of that nature. And then lastly you have override for software installation and this is going to simply loosen the prevention policies around some of the Windows directories and things of that nature to allow software to be installed on the machine without overriding the full prevention policy on this particular machine. Next let's take a look at resource lists. This is where you can tell critical system protection which files should be writable, read only, or should have no access. And again, since we're under global policy options, this is going to apply to the entire machine. So if you want to say something is writable, we're going to expand next to writable. And let's say we want to say allow, but we want to log everybody who touches that particular file. We're going to turn on this first checkbox, and we're going to expand the option. 
and you'll see below list of files that can be modified. And you'll also notice that as I lead the cursor on an option, you'll get a little pop-up that actually explains the line item in a little more detail. We're going to select this list of files, and below you'll see here we can simply click on add, and now we can tell it the path um, of the file that we want to monitor or the directory that we want to monitor. And we fully support wildcards as well. So if you wanted to say c colon slash windows slash star dot star, that would monitor everything within that directory. Or you could do star dot txt, which would monitor just the text files within that directory. You simply give it a name and then you can also add a comment. Comments are very important because later on as we look at um, the summary of this policy, you'll be able to notate um, exactly why you made this particular change and you can also put things like um, a user ID or user initials and the date that the change was made to to help with your your log of when a change was made and why that particular change was made. Alright, so let's say that we wanted to set something as no access. So let's say that we wanted to go in and identify a, um, a critical set of data that, that nobody should have access to. We're going to go down to no access resource lists. We're going to turn on the box for block all access to these files. And we're going to expand the box here. We're going to expand the option and click list of files. We're going to go to add and we're going to type in our path. So let's say, for example, there is a database in the directory c colon slash abc. We'll give it a name. And let's say for uh, the comment, maybe our corporate standard is that um, we start off with our initials and why we're adding the, the, the rule. we simply select OK. Now if we wanted to make changes to this rule we could select it and we could either remove it or we could simply select edit and again go and make any type of change that we needed to. Now the same thing with either writable resources or read-only resources or no access resources also applies to registry settings as well. So if we wanted to block access to a registry key the same methodology would apply. We turn the feature on and we select list of registry keys and again you have the same options here. Here you enter the path to the particular registry key, name it, and provide a comment for why you're taking this particular activity. Our next item to review is network controls. Let's go ahead and expand network controls. The first thing you'll see are inbound and outbound. For this training we're going to take a look at inbound, but the outbound is just actually a mirror image. It's the same capabilities obviously just apply to outbound communication. So the first thing you'll notice we have components. Let's expand on that as well. So components are very simple lists and this applies to IP addresses, TCP ports, and UDP ports. So if the firewall requirements for a particular customer or test are very simple, uh, you might be able to get away with just using the lists. So let's take a look at how we might add an IP address. We expand this option, we turn on list, and we select global inbound address list. And we simply add a value here. This could be a single IP address or it also accepts CIDR notation. You see again we can add the rule name and we can also add a comment. Same thing applies for the ports you simply click add and now enter a value. Either a numeric value can be added or there's actually a drop down list of some of the more well known port ranges and individual ports. But again, if the port you're looking for is not listed in this list, you can simply type in the port number. 
Now if the port lists and host lists are not going to suffice, we can take a look at the network rules. These are your more traditional firewall rules, what you would expect from a uh, checkpoint type firewall system. So we're going to expand network rules, we're going to turn the feature on if we're going to actually make any rules, and we're going to sele select list of rules. Now here we can click add, and we're going to drag this box a little to the right here, and now you have the ability to go in and configure a rule as you wish. So for example, action is either allow or deny, or you can disable something. So if you want to temporarily disable the rule without actually deleting it, you pick the protocol from either TCP or UDP. Keep in mind that ICMP is not covered by critical system protection. So if you write a rule to block a particular IP address from communicating with this server, and then you use ping to test that, the test is actually going to be a success. Um, this is only limited to TCP and UDP communications at this time. You select the local port and again we have our, our ranges here just like we did in the lists. The remote port, or sorry, the, the remote IP. Um, you can notice there are a few uh, variables here. For example, um, the CSP server IP address, so the IP address of the manager. Um, you can on this also type in either a single IP address or again CIDR notation. Select the remote port and then specify any type of logging. Uh, if you want to log as trivial, which is a more enhanced level of logging that has to be turned on, or if you do not want to log the particular activity. And again, we have our rule name, which will show up in the CSP console when you're looking at the event data, and then our comment. Right below our list of rules, you'll notice that there's a checkbox turned on next to globally set the default inbound rules to deny. This is very important to be aware of because the Windows strict policy by default denies any inbound unsolicited communication into the machine. So unless this particular agent requested the traffic, any incoming communication is going to be blocked by default. So either this can be turned off or you can go in here and create both inbound and further down outbound rules to allow certain applications to talk over certain ports. Again, by putting it here, you're allowing the entire machine to offer this type of communication. So talk to this IP address or listen on this port. Another thing to point out is that disabling prevention, the resource lists, the network controls, and several of these other options you're going to see repeated throughout the policy over and over. This is to provide you and the customer with the highest level of flexibility and granularity. So right now, all the changes that we've made apply globally. So if we had assigned something as no access, later on when we get into our server applications, we're going to see these same options, and there we can go and assign something to a particular application or a particular OS service and now make it writable. And essentially, we've now just set up a white list of applications that can go touch that particular resource. And we'll get into more use cases around this um, during future parts to this particular training. Um, next, let's go take a look at host security programs. This is an important feature if you're doing a trial where we have semantic critical system protection running along with another security application. So for example, if you're doing this and you know that McAfee antivirus is running on the machine as well, it's important that under basic options you simply turn this box on and give us the path to the different executables and services that McAfee antivirus is using just so we can be aware of the applications and we're going to treat those applications a little differently.